Okay, welcome to the Theory Seminar. It's a great pleasure to have Isabella Novick, who's a professor in the math department. She's going to tell us about face numbers, centrally symmetric spheres versus centrally symmetric polytope. Thank you. So as you see already in the title, I have board CS twice, because <laughs> that's going to be my abbreviation for those things. But in, so what I'm going to try to do is to tell you the story of this subject. And as you will see, it's quite mysterious. There are still plenty of open problems. And it's, some parts of it are very kind of surprising, or at least I think they are. So let me slowly start introducing all the objects. And please feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. <coughs> so one of the main objects of this talk is going to be a simplicial complex. So all complexes in this talk will be finite. So let's start with an abstract simplicial complex. So to define it, you start with a finite set, V, which we're going to call the vertex set. And then delta is a simplicial complex on V. If it's a collection of subsets of V that satisfy some properties. So what are the properties? So the main one is the second one. So this collection should be closed under inclusion. So if something is in delta, say f and g is a subset of f, then g also must be in delta. And then I will also usually assume that every one element subset is an element of delta. And usually I will drop those parentheses around one element subsets. So the elements of delta are called faces. Uh, singletons are called vertices, so doubletons. In a second, we'll start calling edges. Well, so that's the definition. And of course, it's a very kind of dry definition, so you want to see pictures. But and it's very easy to transform that definition into a geometric notion. So how do we do that? So we do that for the notion of geometric realization. So what is that? So let's say my complex has n vertices. And let's label them v1 up to vn. So here's what I can do. So I can take. I can look at Rn and take the endpoints of the standard basis. Or I don't need to be as specific, and I can just take any n finely independent points in Rn. So now if you give me a face, I will look at the indices. So a face is just a set. So I look at those indices, and so I have the corresponding points in Rn, and I take their convex hull. And so that's what's called a geometric simplex. So for instance, triangle is one. And the line segment is an L1. And because my points were chosen in Rn, kind of in a way that they're affinely independent, if I take two faces, F and G, and I look at the corresponding geometric simplices, the intersection of the two will just be the convex hull of the intersection. So I don't have kind of any redundant intersections. And so to define the geometric realization, I will just take the union of all of those geometric simplices. So for every face, I have such a simplex. I look at the union. So that's a picture. And of course, according to that definition, it should be in R4. But it's so usually you can embed those things into much smaller dimension. Well, and so now, since it's a subset of Rn, there is a topology induced from Rn. And so we can start talking about topological properties. So for instance, we can say that our complex is a simplicial sphere if the geometric realization is homeomorphic to the sphere. And so let me show some examples. So probably the first example that comes to mind is the boundary complex of a polytope. So what is a polytope? So a polytope is just the convex hull of finitely many points in, and I guess I switch to RD. Um, so here's an example of a polytope. So this polytope, some polytopes are called simplicial. So a polytope is simplicial if all of its faces, and I'm not going to define what the face of a polytope is, but hopefully it's pretty intuitive. Right? So for instance, here we have six vertices, we have a number of edges, and we have a number of two-dimensional faces. So all of those faces are geometric simplices in the sense that I just discussed. 
And so if all faces of my polytope are geometric simplices, I will call it a simplicial polytope. So this one is simplicial, but for instance, a cube. Not sure which yes, marker. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so for instance, this guy is not simplicial because all of its two-dimensional faces are not simplices. Maybe another example. So this guy is not simplicial because again, some of the faces are triangles, but one of the faces is not a simplex. So being simplicial basically means that. So if the polytope is d-dimensional, so it's simplicial if every top-dimensional phase has exactly d plus one vertices. Okay, so if we have such an object, we can look at its boundary. That's a simplicial complex. So it's not hard to see that if you start with a simplicial polytope, then its boundary complex is a simplicial sphere. That's easy. Now in dimension, so if you look at a three-dimensional polytope, its boundary is a two-dimensional simplicial sphere, but also the opposite is true, the converse is true. So any two-dimensional simplicial sphere is the boundary of some polytope. And that's an easy consequence of the famous Steiner sphere. Well, so it means that, yeah, so unfortunately this theorem works only in small dimensions. So already in dimension four, our intuition is completely wrong. Uh, yeah? Simplicial sphere. Uh, so a simplicial sphere is any simplicial complex whose geometric realization is homeomorphic oh. to a sphere. Yes, yeah, so for instance, all boundary of polytopes are. But, so this surprising, hopefully it's surprising, theorem of Kali and Feifel and Ziegler tells us that most of simplicial spheres are actually not realizable as the boundary of a polytope. So if you have a three-dimensional or higher dimensional sphere, if you pick a random such sphere, it will not be polytopal. So, so what do you mean by, oh, I see, random, because it's simplicial, you're choosing uh, the, the maximum dimensional faces at random? Is, is, is well, so, so, yeah, so the proof is actually, it's hard to give one example. So there is a very famous Barnett sphere, so dimension three and has eight vertices, and you cannot realize it as a polytope. But so for- The question is what is the most mean? Like what is the measure? Yeah, so there is a notion of a combinatorial type. So usually we are just interested in the, in how the faces are contained in each other. And so if you take, so fix a number of vertices, um, so fix a dimension, right? Um, and look at the number of all, so let me call it P, D, N, of all combinatorial types of d-dimensional polytopes with n vertices. Simplicial d let, let's, call, let's say simplicial d-dimensional polytopes with n vertices. On the other hand, you can look at the number of combinatorial types of simplicial spheres, dimension d minus one and vertices. Take the ratio and take the limit as n goes to infinity, and it very rapidly converges to zero, as long as d is at least four. So that's kind of what I mean by most. So the proof, so Klein gave a proof for spheres of dimensions four and up, and then Feifel and Ziegler gave the proof for the three-dimensional spheres. And so their proof is kind of, it's very hard from the proof to, to actually give examples of such spheres. So because what they did is, so there were bounds, there were known upper bounds on that quantity due to um, Goodman and Pollock. And so what they did is they constructed a bunch of spheres and counted them. So that's a lower bound on that quantity. And even those two numbers were already so far apart from each other. So that's kind of, yeah, so it's, it sounds very surprising because our intuition is so low dimensional, but nonetheless, that's the result. And so, so the question, since I'm coming from combinatorics, the question I will be interested in is concerns counting. 
So given a polytope or given a sphere, we can define dimensions of those objects. So first of all, for any simplicial complex, it doesn't have to be polytope or sphere. If you have a face, it's just a set, right? So you can count the number of elements. And we define the dimension of that face to be the number of elements minus 1. So why minus 1? Well, you want the dimension of a point to be 0. Um, and so the dimension of the, simplex, of the complex is then defined as the maximum dimension of its faces. So for instance, the boundary complex of that three-dimensional polytope is a two-dimensional sphere. And then you can count faces. So let's denote by f sub i the number of i-dimensional faces. And we usually arrange them in a vector. It's called the f-vector. So here we have six vertices, 12 edges, and eight facets. And then you can, in principle, ask, so if you have a collection of nice simplicial complexes, like triangulations of spheres or of manifolds, you can ask, what can you say about those collections of f-vectors? So in particular, the question I will be interested in concerns upper bounds. So given, so let's fix dimension and the number of vertices. And then we can look at the class of all spheres with those two parameters or of all simplicial polytopes. And well, we can ask how big so can the number of y-dimensional faces of those objects be as a function of DNN? And it's not. So it might be that the answers are different, right? Because spheres form such a bigger class than polytopes. But actually, it turns out that the answers are the same. And so let me slowly talk about that. So Motzkin um, proposed the following conjecture. And in a second, I will tell you where these strange expressions are coming from. But so he proposed the following conjecture just for polytopes. He said, well, so if you have a d-dimensional polytope with n vertices, the conjecture said that the number of top-dimensional faces is always bounded by the sum of two binomial coefficients. So why was it interesting? Why is it interesting? Well, so partly because of the dual statement. So for each polytope, there is something called a dual polytope. And under duality, vertices correspond to facets and facets to vertices. And also, you can define polytope as the bounded intersection of finitely many half spaces. And so if you think of that dual language, then basically for the dual polytope, n will become the number of facets. And you're asking what's the largest number of vertices it can have. And yeah, so if conjecture is true, then that's the statement. And of course, that's kind of bound on the number of operations you might need for the simplex algorithm. And more precisely, so what Motzkin conjectured is that in the class of all d-dimensional simplicial polytopes with n vertices, a certain polytope called the cyclic polytope, and I'm going to just describe it in, in the next slide, uh, simultaneously maximizes all the face numbers. And so that number is just the number of facets of that polytope. And then the CLI, who actually worked here for more than 50 years, extended that conjecture pretty dramatically to a class of the so-called Eulerian simplicial complexes. So in that generality, the conjecture is still open. But yeah, so in this talk, let me concentrate on simplicial spheres. So let's pretend that his part of conjecture says that the same holds for spheres. That even if you look at all possible spheres, still that polytope simultaneously maximizes all the face numbers. And so despite the fact, so assuming conjecture is true, and in a second I will tell you that it is, so despite the fact that polytopes form such a small fraction of spheres, at least from the point of view of the upper bound theorem, the f vector cannot see any difference. OK, so that's the conjecture. And now let me tell you what the cyclic polytope is. So to help you the rest of the talk, I will start with maybe not the most standard definition. So let's start with even dimensional cyclic polytopes. And so what we can do is we can consider what is known as the moment curve, actually. So let's start with trigonometric moment curve. So it's so let's say, OK, so it's a function from R to R2K. 
that takes a real number t to a point whose coordinates are cosine and sine of multiples of t. So cosine and sine of t, and then 2t, 3t, all the way till you get to kt. And of course, you can see that sine and cosine are periodic, so we don't actually need to consider the whole real line. We can actually think of that function as defined on a unit circle. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to kind of identify uh, the unit circle with the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And well, pictures. <laughs> so I can draw pictures in dimension 4 where it actually becomes interesting. But in dimension 2, well, so trigonometric curve is the identity. So it's just the identity map on a unit circle. So how do you define the cyclic polydob? You pick distinct points on a unit circle. You look at their images on this trigonometric moment curve. You take the convex hull. So in dimension two, you get no surprises. You just get a polygon. And we will see in a second that it actually has some surprising properties. And I guess for that reason, it was discovered and rediscovered by many people, including Krasadori, Gale, Motskin, and others. So what are those properties? So let's start with those that may be not so surprising. Well, maybe they are. I don't know. It depends on. But so the point is, so if you pick those endpoints on the unit circle, of course, you will get, you pick a different set of points, you will get a different polytope, but they all will have the same combinatorial type. So the, the incidence structure between faces is completely independent of your choice of those n real numbers as long as they are distinct. And so we can talk about the cyclic polytope. Well, it's always full dimension. It's always simplicial. Those endpoints you chose, each of them always forms a vertex. So none of them is in the convex hull of the rest. OK, so that so far maybe no big surprises. But now hopefully comes a surprise. So if you pick any, so this polytope is what is called k neighborly. So what does that mean? It means that you pick any k vertices and they form the vertex set of a face. So let's try to parse it. So if k is 2, so if my polytope is four-dimensional, every two vertices are connected by an edge. Well, so in three-dimensional world, that's unheard of. Unless you are a simplex, you cannot have that property. What's more is if my k is 3, for instance, then not only every two vertices form an edge, but every three form a triangle. And in general, for any dimension k, or 2k, so for any number k, so my polytope is 2k dimensional, but every k vertices form a face. Well, so if every k vertices form a face, that means that at least in dimensions up to k minus 1, really every subset that can be a face of that dimension is a face. So I really have n choose i faces in dimension i minus 1, and that that make what makes the conjecture plausible. So not only plausible, but it actually takes tells us that in the first half of dimensions, the conjecture is obvious. The hard work is actually to prove it in the upper half of dimensions. Well, so now you might be wondering, so what do we do if d is odd? Well, so here is the most standard definition of the cyclic polytope. So you basically, instead of taking the trigonometric moment curve, you look at the usual moment curve, which is really from real numbers to Rd, takes real number t to a point whose coordinates are powers of t. And now you pick n distinct real numbers, you look at the, their images on the moment curve, you take the convex hull, and it turns out that it still has the same properties. So it's still full dimensional, it's still simplicial, it's still half of d neighborly, even if d is odd. And if d is even, the two notions coincide, or at least up to combinatorial isomorphism. OK, so these are those polytopes. And then uh, let me tell you about the upper bound theorem. So it says, so basically it says that the conjecture is true. So among all simplicial polytopes and even among all simplicial spheres, the cyclic polytope simultaneously maximizes all the phase numbers. Well, maybe let me say a few words about proofs. So McMillan proved the 
the result for polytopes. And so what he used is an idea of a shelling. So it turns out that if you have a polytope, its facets can always be ordered in a certain nice way called shelling order. And then you can use that order to do induction. And that's kind of what he did. Unfortunately, most of spheres are not shellable. So if you want to extend the result to spheres, you need something else. And so Stanley used a completely different technique. It actually has a lot of tools from commutative algebra. So Stanley and Huxter independently of each other defines a certain object. So for any simplicial complex, they defined what is known as now as Stanley Reisner ring of that complex. It's a quotient of a polynomial ring. And then Reisner, who was a student of Hoxter, proved that if your complex is a sphere, then the ring is coin Macaulay. That has a, that's a very famous notion in algebraic geometry, for instance. And so coin Macaulay rings have very a lot of nice properties. And then Stanley used those properties to prove the upper bound conjecture for spheres. OK, so to summarize what we saw so far, because in a second we are going to start discussing centrally symmetric variants of those objects. So, this, so there are simplicial polytopes. They form a tiny fraction of simplicial spheres. Yet the f vector, at least on the upper bound, uh, theorem level doesn't see the difference. So among all <coughs> simplicial spheres and polytopes with a fixed number of vertices and of a fixed dimension, these polytopes simultaneously maximizes all the phase numbers. Now let me mention another thing. Um, so Motkin actually conjectured two parts. So his conjecture had two parts. The second part was that the cyclic polytope is the only maximizer. So that turns out to be completely false. You can replace the cyclic polytope with any half of the neighborly polytope sphere. So the question is, do those exist apart from the cyclic polytope? It turns out that yes, there are plenty of them. Uh, so I guess the latest construction that kind of gives the record number of such polytopes is due to Arnold Padrol. But in principle, there is a conjecture of gil Kali that's still unsolved that as n goes to infinity, a random simplicial polytope is going to be half of d neighborly. So we don't know that yet, but okay. So that kind of well depends on what you use. So Stanley's proof is kind of a few lines, right? But he he relies on 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 Con Macaulay rings. Well, so Macmillan's proof actually can, yeah, so it's probably two or three pages if you do it carefully and already know something about polytopes. Yeah, and there are simpler proofs, like so there is a proof by Gil Kalai. I don't remember, I think the title is something like a simple proof of the upper bound theorem for shallable spheres. So there are more proofs now available. But again, so once you kind of have those properties, they're not hard. It was, I mean, so they actually give you something stronger. They give you something on the about the H numbers. And I guess one of the ideas was to define those numbers, which is not at all obvious from, from, the, from the statement. Okay, so let's move slowly to centrally symmetric polytopes and spheres. So let me try to define those. Well, for polytopes, it's easy to define. So a centrally symmetric polytope is what you think it is. It's a polytope that's symmetric about the origin. So if each point x, it also contains minus x. And so this guy is going to be our constant example. So it's centrally symmetric, right? So assuming I put, okay, the notion depends on translation. So if I put it so that the origin is somewhere here, it will be centrally symmetric. Well, so let's try to mimic that definition and define the notion of central symmetry for simplicial complexes. So here is a definition. So let's say that something is centrally symmetric, a simplicial complex is centrally symmetric if we can find a map, an involution on its vertex set, 
that gives us some nice involution on the faces. So what do I mean by that? So I need some map on the vertex set that takes a face to a face. So it's, it must be a simplicial map. I also want to have the following property. So if I apply my map twice, I get the face I started with. So that's kind of what we expect from the from our polytopal intuition, right? And I also want it to be free. So the first part, so this says it's a simplicial map. This says it's an involution. Now I want it to be a free involution. So what does that mean? Well, so the empty face always stays empty no matter what I do. But if I take any other face and I apply my map, I want to get an honestly new face. So here are some examples. Here is a non-example. So for instance, I can look at this pentagon uh, and take a map that maps A to A prime, A prime to A, B to B prime, B prime to B, and fixes C. So why it's not central symmetry? Well, of course, there is a problem here because C stays the same. But there is another problem, right? Because so this edge, if I apply my map, I'll get A prime A. That's the same edge, and that's not allowed. So brings us to a very nice property. So whenever I have in a central symmetric complex, whenever I have a vertex and it's antipod, so I'm going to refer to, to the image of V as the antipod of V. So whenever I have such a pair, it's not an edge. Why? Because if it were an edge, then that map would fix that edge, and that's not allowed. OK, so that means that if I'm about to talk about neighborliness of centrally symmetric things, I need to modify my definition, right? Because this thing cannot be even too neighborly. No two antipodal vertices are connected by an edge. Well, but they can modify it easily. So let's say that the centrally symmetric complex is k neighborly if that's the only abstraction. If any k vertices, no two of each antipodes, actually forms, form a face. And again, so here, so this guy is called an octahedron. Well, in high dimensions, I will define it soon. In high dimensions, we'll call it a cross polytope. So it's always, so that's kind of an analog of a simplex. So that's a central, smallest centrally symmetric polytope. So it's always, so if it's three dimensional, for instance, it's free neighborly. If it's d-dimensional, it's d-neighborly. Um, so here you can just see it, right? So for instance, you can easily check that so what is not allowed? So I, I need to check all three subsets that don't contain two antipodal vertices. So let's color antipodal vertices in the same color. So I need to check that every free set that contains exactly one orange vertex, one purple, and one gray vertex forms a triangle. Well, you can easily check that. So this guy is, in general, yeah, so OK. So here is a definition of the cross polytope in dimension D. So you take the endpoints of the standard basis. You, to make it centrally symmetric, you add minuses of those guys. Take the convex hull. It's called the cross polytope. And it's not hard to see that it's always de-neighborly in this centrally symmetric sense. OK, you can say, well, cyclic polytope has a lot of vertices, arbitrary many vertices. Can we have half of de-neighborly things in the centrally symmetric world that have arbitrarily many vertices. Well, so eventually we'll get to that question. But for now, so here is an example due to McMullen and Shepard. So they notice that if you start basically with the cross polytope and then add in two additional vertices, so the sum of all EIs and its antipod, take the convex hull, the thing is, of course, centrally symmetric. And so what they proved is that it's half of de-neighborly. And it's kind of easy to see that if exactly as in a world without symmetry assumption, if you have more than 2D vertices, then you can never have neighborliness more than half of D. So basically, one of the questions we can ask, can you have neighborliness exactly half of D? So maybe any questions so far? OK, so then the questions we are going to uh, focus on are, so again, if we fix D and N, and we look at centrally symmetric simplicial polytopes with those parameters, or centrally symmetric simplicial spheres, 
Okay, so maybe I didn't say what centrally symmetric simplicial sphere is. So it's a simplicial complex that's both centrally symmetric and the sphere. Well, so we can ask, well, so how neighborly can those things be? And we can also ask for the analog of the upper bound problem. So what is the largest number of faces we can have? But so let's leave faces for now alone, and let's try to concentrate on neighborliness. And again, so because we know that polytops form a much smaller fraction than spheres, it might be that the answers are actually different, because now we have some additional assumption it's centrally symmetric. So, well, so before jumping into that, so maybe let me say a few words about what motivates those questions. Well, so, so first of all, if we drop the central symmetry assumption, we know the answer, right, to both questions. Now, if we add that assumption, how much can it hurt? But maybe more, so here's some additional reasons. So it turns out that somehow central symmetric polytops with many faces actually have real life applications. So it was noticed by Donoho and his collaborators that the moment you have such a polytop, you can work on some problems in sparse signal reconstruction and also in error correcting codes. Another reason is the following result due to Ajin and Stanley from early 90s. Um, so they both noticed that kind of exactly in analogy with usual polytops and spheres without symmetry assumption, the same, the following thing holds. So if you have a centrally symmetric d minus one dimensional simplicial sphere with n vertices, then a sphere that's half of d neighborly would simultaneously maximize all those face numbers with a caveat, assuming such a sphere exists. So I guess that was the reason Stanley didn't publish it because. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hopefully that's kind of enough motivation to start discussing those questions. And so let's start with polytops because usually polytops are easier. So let me maybe summarize a little bit of what we already saw. So if you look at the cross polytop, so that's an analog of simplex. It has two d vertices, it's d dimensional and can be d neighborly. I mean, it is d neighborly. Well, so then you start increasing the number of vertices and you hope still to find something half of d neighborly or at least you want to find something that is as neighborly as possible. And here, some very surprising things start happening. Um, maybe to spoil the fun. So we don't actually know how neighborly can central symmetric polytops be. So here's what we know. And kind of the work on that was started by Branko Grunbaum about 50 years ago. So he, he looked at the d equals to four case, and then McMillan and Sheffer generalized his result to all d. So what they proved is that so if you have a d-dimensional, central symmetric d-dimensional polytop with that many vertices, so any central symmetric polytop has an even number of vertices. So 2d is the smallest one. The next thing, smallest thing is 2d plus two. So the example that we saw is actually half of d neighborly, and you can never get anything more neighborly. Well, so no surprises so far. But then what they notice next is that if you add in two more vertices, somehow the neighborliness drops. It can now be, can never be more than d plus one over three. Well, so what does it tell us about four dimensional polytops? So if my d is four, that's 12, tells me that no centrally symmetric four dimensional polytop with 12 vertices can be too neighborly. And actually, they looked at those numbers, so d, half of d, d plus one over three, and they conjectured that actually neighborliness drops very, very fast. So they conjectured that already with four d vertices, you cannot be even too neighborly. So we will see in a second that that's false. But what does turn to be true is that if you have sufficiently many vertices, then you really will not be even too neighborly. So Burton proved it first, and he needed so his estimate gave roughly half of d to the power of half of d vertices. Okay, so 
as I said, we still have no idea. So if you give me two parameters, D and N, I still can tell you what's the maximum possible neighborliness that such a centrally symmetric polytope can have. But we do have some, we do know some asymptotic results. And actually, I should have started that in, said that in the beginning. So I got interested in those things when Nati Lignal was visiting CS department some number of years ago. <laughs> I think it was 2004, maybe. OK, so it turns out that, so let's introduce some notation. And don't, don't read too closely that slide. In a second, it's quite technical. In a second, I will concentrate on two neighborliness, and that will be much easier. But so basically, if you have a, number, a dimension d, and the number of vertices, which is twice d plus some excess number of vertices, then the neighborliness cannot, is kind of between those two numbers, the maximum possible neighborliness. So what does that mean? So in particular, that means that if m is proportional to d, well, here I have a constant. So basically, the neighborliness of my polytope can be proportional to d. So there do exist polytopes with four d vertices whose neighborliness is proportional to d. Don't ask me how proportional. I think we, Nachi and I got something like d over 400. There are better things like maybe d over 80, but still. On the other hand, if my m is exponential in d, right, then here I have something that's larger than d. And well, and so the, this ratio is less than 1. And so indeed, the moment my polytope has exponentially many vertices, it cannot be even two neighborly. OK, let me also mention that the lower bound was also proved all in the dual language and both at the same time by Rudelson and Vershinian. Let me also mention that both proofs, uh, theirs and ours, for the lower bound actually use probabilistic methods. So it's kind of hard to produce those polytopes, but we know they exist. For the upper bound, we used a volume trick, and I will show you some simple version of it in, in a few minutes. OK, so that's really quite technical. So let's concentrate on the two neighborliness. Can you just yeah. I have no idea. I don't think it's. So in fact, so to work with those probabilistic methods, what you do is, so each polytope, there is something called Gale transform. So it's a collection of vectors in RD. And you actually work with those collections. And that's much easier to, <laughs> to generate. Um, OK, so two neighborliness. So let me show you two theorems. Um, so the first one says that, in fact, if you have two to the d or more vertices, you already cannot be two neighborly. On the other hand, so we still don't know what's the maximum number of vertices a centrally symmetric polytope can have and still be two neighborly. But we know that it's squeezed between those two numbers, two to the d and roughly half of that. And actually, it turns out that those two theorems, I will be able to basically give you a proof in the next three minutes. So the hardest part is kind of seeing the statement. Well, so let's start with theorem three. So how do we make those polytopes? Well, so, so whenever you see this number, right, probably the first thing you think about is a cube. So what you do is you start with um, um, d minus one dimensional cube. Oops, I shouldn't do that. Um, so you start with a d minus one dimensional cube. It has two to the d minus one vertices. So you put it in, so you, you look at it sitting inside Rd minus one, but you put it in Rd, so at height zero. So you look at the hyperplane at height zero. So here is your d minus one dimensional cube. But now you have one additional dimension, right? So what you do is you take those vertices and you slightly move them using that new dimension. You move them so as to preserve central symmetry. And you do it in a certain smart way. Uh, so you move those things. Well, so in the picture that I'm drawing with quadrilateral, <laughs> so you can't do too much. But basically, you move those vertices. You take the convex hull. And turns out that what you get is too neighborly. And you can even add those two new vertices. What do you do? So you take the vertex right above the origin that's 
quite high and you take its anti antipode and you take the convex hull of those new vertices and it turns out that it's still too neighbor. And if you think about that, so that's actually what we have in dimensions two and three, right? So the only two neighborly central asymmetric polytopes in small dimensions are the square and the octahedron, and that's what we are getting here. Okay, so in any case, so there are very ex kind of very explicit constructions of um, central asymmetric two neighborly polytopes with roughly two to d minus one vertices. Well, so how do we prove that you cannot have more than two to the d? Well, so here is a trick, and it goes back to Grun Dancer Grunbaum paper, and their paper. Actually, the idea probably goes back to Minkowski. So what have, so what you do is instead of concentrating on one polytope, you concentrate on a family of translates of that polytope. So you start with your polytope. And for each vertex, you take that polytop and you translate it by that vertex. So if the polytop has 100 vertices, you will have 100 polytops. And so what turns out is that, and I will not show you the proof of observation one, but it's very easy. It's a two-line proof. So it turns out that if your polytop is centrally symmetric and too neighborly, and you look at those translates, then they have pairwise disjoint interiors. So in a sense, this picture is not misleading. Well, so if you believe in that observation, then what can we do? We can look at the volume of the union of those polytops. So on one hand, they have pairwise disjoint interiors. So the, union, the volume of the union is just the sum of the volumes. And each of those polytops is just a translate of the original one. So all of those guys have the same volume as P. So we have here V summons. Each of them is the volume of P. So the result is just that. Okay. On the other hand, well, so let's look at each of those polytops. It's a translate of P by an element in P. So the result sits inside twice P. So the union sits inside twice P. So the volume of the union can never be more than the volume of twice P. But that's just 2 to the d times the volume of p. And now you compare those two, and you immediately get the bound. Yeah, so the proof is extremely easy. OK, so now let's try to think about phase numbers. So if our central asymmetric polytope has a lot of vertices, and a lot means just more than 2 to the d, then we definitely know that the number of edges is smaller than the number of I mean, the, the number of edges in the complete graph minus one complete matching, right? So, but then you, you're wondering, you may start wondering, so how, how close to that number can it be? And so here is some notation. So let's denote by f max dn1 the maximum possible number of edges that our polytope can have. And of course, I mean, so you can define that for number of i-dimensional phases, although I'm not going to talk, I'm just, I will just concentrate on edges because as you will see in a second, already there, we don't know anything. Well, so you can ask, well, so how many edges can a four-dimensional central symmetric polytope have? And the answer is we don't know. <laughs> so what we do know is that that maximum possible number of edges is actually quite a bit smaller than n choose two. It's actually squeezed roughly between 15 16 of n choose two and three quarters of n choose two. Well, what about high dimensions? So what we can say is that this number is again squeezed between roughly, so you always lose at least one over two to the d fraction of edges. And there are polytops that lose less than one over square root of three to the d fraction of edges. So that's basically what we know. So to prove the upper bounds, so the upper bounds are from a joint work with Sasha Barvenog. Um, and here, what we use is a modification of a volume argument that I just showed you. Here, we actually use explicit constructions. And that's from a joint work with Sasha, Sunjin Lee, and yeah. So Sunjin Lee was Sasha's student. So maybe let me spend just a minute to show you uh, how this construction works. And that's why I actually started 
with trigonometric moment curve rather than the usual moment curve. So here is what you do. So you look at a ver version of a trigonometric moment curve. And what seems to work is the curve where you look at the, yeah, so first of all, to make it centrally symmetric, you need to use only odd multiples of t. And that's what we tried to do for a long time, to look at multiple of t, one more t, three t, five t, and so on. Turns out we were wrong. Turns out that somehow if you look at, if your multiples are powers of three, somehow that helps. And so that's the curve. And so how do you place your points on the curve? And we want the number of vertices to be arbitrarily large. So that's why I need an additional parameter that will kind of help me bump the number of, to make the number of vertices as large as I can. So forgetting about S for a moment. And so M is basically just half of dimension. So what you do is you look at the regular um, polygon with that many vertices. So it's inscribed in a unit circle. But now you replace each vertex with a very small cluster of S vertices. And you do it in a way that what you get is still centrally symmetric. And you take the images of those points on that version of trigonometric moment curve. You take the convex hull, and turns out that it has a lot of edges. So to be more precise, every two vertices form an edge unless they come from antipodal clusters. And so that gives you bound from the previous slide. So in any case, so there is a construction but we really don't know. So just coming back to the previous slide for a second, we really have no idea whether the bound is closer to, to that side or to that side. Okay, so for polytopes, we don't know basically anything. So let's talk about spheres. Maybe we will be luckier. Um, yeah, so for polytopes, even in dimension four, we really don't know even the number of edges it can have. So no plausible upper bound conjecture at the moment. Well, but we do have this theorem. So if somehow we can find those spheres that are centrally symmetric and highly neighborly, at least we will know the upper bound uh, for spheres. So do such spheres exist? And well, so, there were some hints that they do. <laughs> so the first biggest hint was from Jokers, who in 1995 proved that at least for three-dimensional spheres, we are in luck. So for every even number of vertices, there exists a centrally symmetric three-dimensional sphere with n vertices uh, that's too neighborly. So let me just remind you that, so for four-dimensional polytops, once you hit 12 vertices, you cannot be too neighborly already. And here, it's true for any even number, no matter how big. Well, and actually, so, so let me worry for now only about odd dimensions, because if you, there is an operation called suspension. If you take suspension and increases the dimension by one, it increases the number of vertices by two, but it doesn't spoil the neighborliness. Okay, so that's a good sign, right? And then Frank Lutz in his PhD thesis in 19, 1999 actually found by computer experiments um, higher dimensional central symmetric spheres with similar properties. So he found five dimensional sphere with 16 vertices that is free neighborly. So again, with polytops, that's impossible. He also found, and he actually found quite a few types. Um, also in dimension seven, there do exist spheres with 18 vertices that are for neighborly. So that kind of hints that maybe in general, such spheres exist. And it turns out that they do. And so this summer, we've, we proved it with my former student, Hailun Jain. So for every D starting before, uh, and for any even number of vertices, there is a centrally symmetric simplicial sphere with that many vertices of dimension d minus one, that's half of d neighborly. And so our proof is quite technical. So what you do is you start with Jokush's construction 
And then you kind of do induction on dimension, number of vertices, and also there is another parameter that comes in. And kind of the idea is that to get this from one sphere to another sphere, so you, you have your sphere, right? And so what you do is you find a certain ball, and a centrally symmetric ball. And you find a ball that's big enough, but not very big. And then you delete that ball, and instead, so you add two new vertices, and you cone that first vertex with the boundary, and second vertex with the boundary of that guy. And uh, so you can see that those balls should satisfy some nice conditions. So for instance, they are not allowed to have interior vertices. Because the moment you, if there is an interior vertex, then the moment you delete that ball, you lose that vertex. And you don't want that. And so, so you need those balls to have some nice properties. So all vertices should be on the boundary. All edges should be on the boundary. But in any case, so there is a construction. And so together with that theorem of Stanley and Adin that I mentioned, we now have a complete solution to the upper bound problem for spheres. So somehow, once you add central symmetry, spheres become easier to understand. Um, OK, and so I'm almost out of time. So let me summarize what we saw. So we do now have a complete solution for the upper bound problem for centrally symmetric spheres. But for centrally symmetric polytops, we don't have any clue. Um, so, for instance, we don't even know the number of edges of a four-dimensional polytop. We don't know what's the largest number of vertices that our polytop can have and still be too neighborly. So, as you see, there are plenty of open questions. And it's somehow very surprising that polytops are less, much less understood than spheres. But, so, let me stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Example here, like why do you need to perturb the points for this polytope? Oh, because uh, so I want a d-dimensional polytope, right? So this poly, okay, sorry. So a cube is not simplicial, right? So a cube is not simplicial, and it's also not too neighborly, right? Because in a cube, um, well, so a two-dimensional cube is an exception. All two-dimensional polytopes are simplicial. <laughs> But the cube is not simplicial, right? So for instance, uh, there are plenty of diagonals that are not edges, right? So it's not simplicial. It's not too neighborly. But somehow, so if you take any polytope and you slightly perturb its vertices, you immediately get something simplicial. Yeah, but it turns out that here you also somehow get that too neighborliness. It's very much real. So there was a problem about, so you have a bunch of points in RD, and you want the number of points. So the question is, what's the largest number of points you can choose so that all angles are at most 90 degrees? The answer is 2 to the D, and the cube is the example. Then you change the question. What if you want all of your angles to be acute? And that's actually how this construction came about, too. So there were some conjectures, but a couple of years ago, um, it was proved that you can actually manage with 2 to d minus 1 plus 1. And basically, that's what was their construction. Just that, OK, so they didn't need to worry about central symmetry. And yeah, but yeah, so their goal was to make all angles acute. And for that, you really need an armored dimension. But somehow, you can. Yeah, so if you don't worry about central symmetry, you can. You can perturb those vertices and make all the angles acute. Yeah, so even in that problem, so again, so if, if you wish to count maximum number of vertices that, so that all angles are acute, so now the result is that it's somewhere between those two numbers. But it's not known where it's closer to one or the other. That's wrong, it's still yeah. yeah, so it's basically kind of the same picture, just that there the bounds are that and that. So it's somewhere here.